Hello friends, it's Carla, your online doctor with today's Live in 5. Today is Tuesday, May 5th at 5 p.m. Happy Cinco de Mayo for those of you who are celebrating. Um, so we started talking yesterday about the silent hypoxia many COVID-19 patients present with in the emergency room. And I did have one woman comment and her comments are, are valid. Yes, these people who are sick should go to the emergency room. And my reply was based on what they're saying on the news, which is don't go to the emergency room unless you're extremely sick. And again, I want to point out some of the recommendations that were made in this article, which I go along with. She said, everybody can't buy a pulse oximeter. And I agree. I am not encouraging you if you're healthy and doing great to go out and make that expense. Clearly, um, it's not necessary, okay? But follow through with the end and you'll see where I'm going. Now, the coronavirus attacks lung cells that make surfactant, the substance that helps keep your air sacs in the lungs open between breaths, okay? Without surfactant, these sacs would collapse and getting them open would require an extreme effort with each breath. Unlike most people who just breathe in and out and you have you don't even have any sensation of breathing most of the time. It's, it's a, not a voluntary um, exercise. It's something that happens involuntarily. Um, so as the inflammation from the virus starts to cause these air sacs to collapse, that also results in the oxygen levels in the blood falling since that is where your gas exchange occurs. Now the lungs, however, stay compliant, meaning they're still um, able to do what they need to do and expand and contract with each breath because they're not heavily filled with fluid. So carbon dioxide can still be exchanged pretty easily from the blood back into the lungs and exhaled. Okay, so without a buildup of that carbon dioxide, people don't feel short of breath. Okay, so think about it when you're hyperventilating. What do they usually tell you to do? Put a bag over your face. Why? Because you're rebreathing back that CO2, which controls the respiratory rate. So it's a similar type of thing, um, but in reverse, okay? As opposed to when you're hyperventilating, you're usually breathing off too much carbon dioxide. And if you breathe off too much, your body says, hmm, I don't need to breathe anymore, so I'll stop breathing. When your lungs are very, very inflamed and sick and all of that, your CO2 level builds up, which causes you to breathe faster to try and get it off, okay? So the, the carbon dioxide doesn't build up, so that shortness of breath does not occur, despite the fact that those oxygen levels in these sick COVID-19 patients um, are rapidly dropping. Um, and so the patients compensate, again, for this low oxygen by breathing faster and deeper, but without a conscious thought and without that sensation of feeling short of breath. Now, the inflammation continues and eventually takes over a lot of the lung, but the normal response to the low oxygen makes the situation worse and leads to more air sacs collapsing. So about 20% of COVID pneumonia patients develop the deadlier phase of lung injury where fluid builds up and then the lungs start to stiffen. When that happens, you, they develop acute respiratory failure. Those are the patients that know they needed to be on a ventilator or maybe don't, they don't know it, but they're in severe distress. They're coming in, that's beyond the patients I'm referring to that walk in the door because they're feeling short of breath. This acute respiratory failure is a much later stage, okay? Um, this acute respiratory failure, again, is low oxygen and elevated carbon dioxide. Okay, and those definitely require mechanical ventilation and uh, int with intubation. Now, most patients thankfully never get to this point and recover in about one to two weeks, while the elderly or people with coexisting illnesses can't get through that silent hypoxia phase that I'm talking about, and they are the ones who develop the severe disease much earlier and need to be um, treated sooner and, and assisted in their respiratory condition. So finally, the better screening tool that I mentioned, um, 
there is a way to identify more patients sooner and treat them more effectively. So it requires detecting that silent hypoxia through a common medical device that can be purchased online if it's appropriate for you, okay? You can get them in the local pharmacies sometimes. It's called a pulse oximeter. It is a simple device that you clip onto your finger. If you ever watch any medical shows, you'll see them with a look like a Band-Aid over their finger with a cord that connects to the monitor next to them. And it's going to give on the monitor not only your pulse, your heart rate, but also your oxygen saturation level. Okay, as long as you have circulation to your fingers, these devices are pretty accurate. Okay, this is what we use in anesthesia all the time to monitor somebody's oxygenation. Now, rumor has it this is what alerted doctors to the Prime Minister of England's original COVID diagnosis and prompted his early treatment. Okay, again, that's a rumor. I don't know if it's true. I'm just, that was what was stated in the article, so I'm going with it. I didn't scope check, I didn't snope check it. I didn't, you know, go and see if it was true. I'm just giving you um, what they said. Now, again, I am not suggesting everyone go out and buy a pulse oximeter, but if you have pulmonary disease or you have symptoms, um, it's an inexpensive tool. I think the ones I saw were 40 to $50. Um, and might be worth the money to determine for you if you feel you need to go to the hospital. Okay, going to the emergency room is not as easy as people think. My father's been in the hospital for the last month. It is a scary thing. You can't go with your loved one. You can't see them. You can't spend any time with them. So if they do not need to be in the hospital, you certainly don't want them there. Okay. The hospitals are doing a very good job, at least locally here in South Florida that I know of, keeping COVID-19 patients separate from patients who are not COVID-19. But in the emergency room, you don't know, okay? If somebody's coming in short of breath, that's great. But this article talked about people who came in, one person came in because they, um, it was an elderly person who fainted. Well, it turns out they fainted because they were hypoxic and they had COVID-19, but they weren't isolated as a respiratory condition until after the chest x-ray was done. Okay, so you could be lying next to that person and they're not in isolation because there was no reason to suspect that they were. So going to the emergency room, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying it's not so easy. Just go to the ER. But if you have symptoms, respiratory symptoms, and you're monitoring your oxygenation and your oxygen saturation stays above 95% or whatever, you got no worries. You don't really have to be concerned about going in for treatment. It's if your oxygen saturation begins to drop that it would alert you to something getting worse that you may need to bite the bullet and say, okay, I need to go now. Okay, so that's where I'm trying to... Um, to point out, if you tested positive for COVID-19, it's worth monitoring, okay? You're home, you're fatigued, you're having, you know, some cough, you're, you don't feel good, but you may ride it out at home, but then again, you may not. So you certainly would have that luxury of this extra monitoring. Monitoring your temperature ain't gonna do anything for you because unless you can't lower your fever with over-the-counter traditional ways of lowering temperature and you have fever of 104, 105 and you know you need the emergency room for that, most people that have COVID-19 aren't getting treated for fever. They're getting treated for respiratory condition, respiratory symptoms, okay? So that's where I, I you know, again, I'm giving you my medical opinion. You don't have to follow me. The woman who commented, you know, I appreciate your comment and I hope you appreciate where I'm coming from. It's not meant to be a you're right or I'm right. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. If anybody wants any more information about pulse oximetry, please message me. I mean, I could tell you how they work and all the good things about it. I've been using them for decades. Okay, so on that note, I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. I will see you again tomorrow for another Live in 5.